Okay. Yeah, I think we'll make a start, guys. Um, team's a bit of a nightmare. So, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you're joining from. My name is Tom Davis. I'm one of the product managers here at Arthrex Dubai. Very warm welcome from all at Arthrex and Havana today. We're glad to have you join us for what will be a great insight into the world of osteotomies. During the session, we kindly ask that all attendees keep their mics on mute and cameras off. Any questions that you have, feel free to use the chat box and we'll address these at the end of the webinar. Also, just so that you are aware, we are recording today's session. So we're lucky enough to have a first class faculty on board today. Firstly, Professor Niemeyer. Professor Niemeyer is going to be our moderator for today. Throughout Germany, he is well respected as both a surgeon and as a scientist. Particularly when it comes down to cartilage treatment, he is certainly one of the most trusted specialists. He is a member of multiple well-known orthopaedic societies. He is listed author of over 110 publications and is a reviewer of several international sport journals. On the panel today, we have Dr. IPS Oberoi, Dr. Nagra Shetty, Dr. Clement Joseph and Dr. Bushan Sabnis. Dr. Obroy, the president of the Indian Arthroscopy Society and a pioneer in shoulder, knee and ankle arthroscopy, currently is the head of orthopaedics and chief of joint replacement and arthroscopy department at Atermis Hospital. Dr. IPS has undertaken his training in Germany, South Africa and the UK and has more than 20 years of experience in the orthopaedic world. Dr. Nagra Shetty is a consultant knee and shoulder surgeon based out of Mumbai with specialist interests in osteotomy, osteoarthritis, dislocation treatments and arthroscopic surgery. Dr. Shetty is the fellowship director at Arthrosports in Mumbai. He is very well known and a highly respected speaker and faculty member at numerous national and international events. Thirdly, we have Dr. Clement Joseph. Dr. Joseph is the head and senior consultant at Sims Hospital in Chennai. He has held various fellowships in knee, shoulder and hip arthroscopy in Singapore, Italy, Finland and the UK. Again, with over 20 years of experience in orthopaedics, Dr. Joseph is very well respected and has been faculty at a number of different national and international conferences during his career. Dr. Bushan Sabnis, a senior consultant at SportsMed Clinic, Global Hospital and Hiranandani Hospital, specializing in arthroscopy, arthroplasty and lower limb alignment correction. A previous Brigadier KD Kare Gold Medalist Award winner for academic excellence, Dr. Sabnis previously pursued further specialization at Basingstoke Hospital in the UK, a very well-known osteotomy centre, again with more than 20 years orthopaedic experience. Also, another voice that you may or may not hear today will be that of Bert Brecht, one of our knee product managers from Munich. That's enough from me. I hope everyone enjoys today's session. And over to our moderator and the first presentation, Professor Niemeyer. Yeah, so thank you, Tom, for this very kind introduction. Uh, could you just confirm if you see my presentation appropriately? Yeah, all good. Yeah, perfect. So it's really a pleasure to join you for this really interesting and sophisticated webinar. And uh, my part is actually to introduce the Atrex Power Peak Plate and to give some insights about the principle of high ostibial osteotomy. And why, what I want to remark at the beginning is that when we are talking about indications, we are not exclusively talking about unicompartmental OA, but we are also uh, talking about treatment of ligamentous instabilities. We are talking about osteotomies as protective uh, concomitant surgeries in cartilage repair. And we are also talking about osteotomies being used for patellofemoral pathologies. Since I'm talking about HTO, the issue of patellofemoral pathologies is not that important because usually femoral osteotomies are uh, used in order to treat patellofemoral instability or patellofemoral OA. But nevertheless, the other three parts remain also indications uh, for HTO. Recently, especially in Germany and Europe, but probably also worldwide, the topic of tibial slope really came into focus when we're talking about uh, instability of the knee joint. 
This has been an issue, especially for posterior instabilities for a long time. But recently, the topic of uh, tibia slope increase, for instance, in ACL revision surgery really came into focus. But I will not really uh, talk about that because we have another talk on ACL and osteotomies uh, coming up during this session. Another indication for HTO in instabilities of the knee joint is definitely the hyperextension varus thrust. And there has been some publications that once you're doing an osteotomy exclusive and as an isolated uh, sta uh, standalone treatment, you are really um, able to address also these uh, varus thrust uh, problems appropriately. Nevertheless, the classic indication, and that's what I will be talking about in the next couple of minutes, is definitely osteotomies for asymmetric weight bearing um, in cartilage repair and osteoarthritis. And within the recent years, when talking about concepts for cartilage repair, we really became very strict with alignment issues. And we experienced that also in mild uh, deformities, such as two or three decrease of virus, an additional osteotomy is definitely a benefit for the patient. Uh, Gerrit Bode from our group in Freiburg actually published a paper that demonstrated clear superiority, superiority of ACI with concomitant HTO, even in these mild deformities. And since I'm the first uh, speaker today, I just want to also uh, give some principal comments on alignment and analysis of deformity because this is the essential analysis for all osteotomies we are going to talk about today. And in my personal opinion, at least these angles should be determined in every patient considered for a realignment procedure. And based up of the, on the principle of Tropeli, who actually stated that the best location of deformity correction is location of the deformity, you should really distinguish between deformities located on the femur and those on the tibia. And it is not true that all the deformities, all varus deformities are located on the tibia. Um, for many, many years, actually, it was uh, an, uh, in, uh, the, actually there was the principle of having the varus corrected on the tibia, but this should be done anymore. You should really go for a careful analysis of the deformity. And once there is a femoral varus deformity, as in this case, with the pathologic angle of the distal femur, you should definitely not go for a tibial osteotomy. Otherwise, you this actually leads to an oblique joint line, which is definitely a problem in uh, the aftercare and rehabilitation and further clinical course of the patient. This also leads to the issue of double osteotomy. There will also be a talk on that specific, really important topic uh, during this session today. But nevertheless, just the remark from my side, once you have a significant combined tibial and femoral deformity, Double osteotomy is definitely something which came into focus and which clearly is indicated in order to avoid this oblique joint line problem. This is a study from Matthias Feucht, colleague of mine or former colleague of mine in Freiburg, now also based in, uh, in Stuttgart. And he analyzed virus deformity in more than 300 subsequent patients. And what he actually found just confirms what I was saying before that a majority or a large proportion of these patients with virus deformities uh, do not suffer from isolated tibial deformities, but rather have combined or even isolated femoral deformities. So um, really uh, be aware of that and not really uh, think that all virus deformities needs to be corrected on the tibia. Nevertheless, there are isolated tibial virus deformities as indicated in this patient, and this is definitely a patient 
really qualifies for a high tibial osteotomy. In my personal opinion, once you have a tibial, uh, tibial varus deformity, you should add another parameter, which I personally consider really important, and this is the tibial bone varus angle. Um, you can see that on the right side. Um, it actually um, connects the epiphyseal line and sets this in an angle with the uh, tibial axis. And once you determine this angle, you can really distinguish between an intra-articular and an extra-articular varus. And we have actually published a study on that issue a couple of years ago, even 11 years ago. And this is one of the best prognostic parameters in terms of uh, good clinical outcome following open wedge high tibial osteotomy. And we also use that parameter in order to distinguish um, our indication between unicompartmental knee replacement and HTO. Um, it sounds rather clear. If you have an intra-articular deformity, we rather go for unicompartmental intra-articular therapy. And once we have a pathological TBVA, uh, this re represents an extra-articular deformity. And in our opinion, this indicates an extra-articular therapy, meaning our HTO. This is just a video sequence how we do our HTO. This is the Ramos Infrapatellaris from the Safinos branch. Here you see the pes anorinus, the medial collateral ligament, and we actually just go beneath this uh, superficial fibers of the uh, medial collateral ligament. This is a preparation which usually not long, takes not longer than two or three minutes. And afterwards, this hook is placed just posterior to the tibia in order to protect the neurovascular structures. The osteotomy is uh, performed under continuous uh, radiographic control. Actually, we set up the, uh, the image intensifier parallel to the lateral plateau, and this is how we actually also orientate our uh, saw. What I want to uh, point out is that we really go for biplanar osteotomies in all our cases. And the typical biplanar osteotomy, as you probably know, is the proximal uh, osteotomy. But we also do this uh, specific uh, um, um, osteotomy really frequently, leaving the typical tib uh, tibial tubercle on the proximal part of the osteotomy in order to reduce the patellofemoral pressure or at least not to increase the patellofemoral pressure, um, which is indicated in large corrections, pre-existing patella baja, or in patients suffering from uh, previous patellofemoral cartilage uh, defects in unicompartmental medial uh, o o OA. So the percentage of patients in which we do this uh, modified technique is probably 30 to 40 percent, and it has definitely increased significantly in recent years. Here you see how this works uh, in the OR. Soft tissue protection is really important anterior, but the tubercle, uh, the tuberosity is really left in place. And then since this this modification of the HTO really results in a higher instability. We use a um, leg screw in order to refixate uh, the tuberositis um, in uh, this osteotomy setting. This is the post-operative uh, um, uh, radiograph. Here you can see the open wedge osteotomy using the Atrex power peak plate which really allows visualization of the consolidation afterwards very nicely. And you see the additional leg screw for refixation of the tibia tuberositis. Again, Gavit Bode from our crew performed a biomechanical analysis of this modified uh, uh, technique. And what he was really clearly be uh, what he was able to show really clear was that once you do this modification, you achieve a reduction of the patellofemoral pressure and probably patients with pre-existing cartilage defects or pre-existing patella baja really benefit from that modification. 
The next surgical point I wanted to point out is the issue of tibial slope. As I mentioned before, you can really aim on changing the tibial slope, but probably in the standard cases, you just want to leave it unchanged during the procedure. And what I want to point out is that in these cases, you really need to open the gap asymmetric since different diameters of the tibia in the anterior and posterior part lead to a different edge high. And this is something which is just pure mathematics, but you really need to be aware of that during the surgery. That's why we put the spacer really posterior on the cortex. And then once you open up the gap posteriorly, you achieve a neutral opening in, in terms of uh, the tibial slope. Uh, this is probably something everybody is aware of, of, but I just wanted to point out because I personally consider that really important. And sometimes it's really hard to open up the gap because the posterior cortex of the tibia needs to be cut really carefully and sometimes even two uh, instruments, one placed anterior and the other posterior, help in order to make this asymmetric opening of the gap from the medial side in order to uh, prevent a slope change following the osteotomy. And the last technical issue I want to point out is the issue of hinge fractures. And this is something which has been considered uh, more or less problem, uh, more or less normal, at least for the type 1 stable fractures. Uh, but to be honest, I really recommend to avoid these hinge fractures because a loss of correction is described in li literature once these hinge, hinge fractures occur. A prolonged consolidation process of the osteotomy gap has been described. And for the unstable types of hinge fracture, fracture this is definitely a catastrophe for your individual patient. So you definitely should try to avoid. And there are some interesting strategies in order uh, to avoid. And once is this hinge uh, K wire, which we insert uh, once we observe large corrections, or if a type one hinge fracture occurs intraoperatively, as you can see here in this patient who underwent a large correction for a double, uh, double osteotomy, and he suffered a type 1 hinge fracture during the surgery and in these cases you really can insert this hinge wire in order to stabilize the osteotomy. And how impressive that is, is shown by this sawbone uh, video. Here you see this type hinge fracture which occurs during the opening and you really see how instable the situation is. And by inserting just one little K wire you can really help to stabilize the situation really impressively uh, during the surgery and really sufficient during the surgery. And in approximately 60 to 70% of our osteotomies, uh, talking about larger correction, we also used this K-wire as prevention for hinge uh, fracture, and this turned out to be really sufficient. Here you see how by just introducing this one K-wire, the stability of this hinge fracture really increases uh, dramatically. So just go for that hinge wire um, in, in larger corrections, or if you are afraid of producing uh, type 1 hinge fracture. And the last point of my talk is about implants, because the choice of the implant is really something which is essential in my personal point of view. There have been biomechanical studies performed uh, by many colleagues, including this study by Jens Agneskircher from Hannover, published uh, 13 years ago. And what he found is that an open wedge osteotomy from a biomechanical point of view is a really demanding uh, surgery and that actually plate fixatures using angle stable implants should be the gold standard in my personal opinion. The Tomafix plate from Synthes is definitely a gold standard, but nevertheless, it's kind of big. We have also published some results 
that demonstrated that um, in many cases, approximately 60% of the cases, soft tissue irritation is an issue. And this is actually why the power peak blade because became our standard implant in recent years from a biomechanical point of view, as shown in this biomechanical testing here, it is pretty similar to the Tomofix blade, which is the gold standard from a biomechanical point of view, but nevertheless um, adds the benefit that due to this peak uh, design, you can really observe the consolidation process during the clinical course after the high tibial osteotomy. And due to the variation of angle stability, you are also able to avoid conflicts, for instance, with the tibial tunnel in case of an ACL reconstruction. But this is an issue we will be talking later uh, on. Here at uh, the end, you see uh, the how the Atrex plate works in place. Uh, fixed with angle stable screws at the end of the surgery. And we are really positive. To be honest, I have not uh, um, experienced a single complication using that plate for now uh, 10 years. So thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention. And I'm really excited about uh, the following talks of this webinar. We have actually decided to have the discussion at the end uh, of the uh, today's web webinar, so all are uh, all of your uh, questions uh, will be uh, collected, and uh, therefore I would actually hand over uh, to the second speaker today, which is Dr. Oberoi, and he will be uh, demonstrating a surgical video on high tibial osteotomy using the Atrex Pudu plate as an alternative uh, implant for this uh, technique. Uh. Thank you, Philip. Uh, uh, Ruchir, have we been able to download uh, the presentation and can you upload it to me? Ruchir? Ruchir? I'll directly try and screen share again from my desktop if it is possible. Otherwise, Ruchir has a presentation. In. Yeah, give it a, a quick try, Dr. I IPS. Uh, if not, then I think we'll move straight to uh, Dr. Shetty next and then we'll, okay. we'll come back, Perfect. right? But give it a so try. Well. Move to Dr. Shetty and because Ruchir is downloading it, I think he will put it up. So maybe. Sure, okay. okay. Dr. Shetty, over to you, if possible. Yes, I'll so just start uh, sharing my screen. Yeah, yeah, I... Can you guys see my uh, first slide? Yes. So shall I go ahead with the presentation? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I've been asked to speak about double level osteotomy and uh, it is a complex topic and uh, whatever possible, what are the tips and tricks that I've learned over the years, uh, I will try to simplify this enigma. This is my profile. I practice as a dedicated arthroscopy, uh, complex knee and shoulder surgeon in Mumbai. So the first thing that needs to come to your mind when you see this sort of a virus in a patient is that the deformity is severe. These patients are the ones where you would obviously get the scanogram done. And the scanogram typically will show a significant mechanical axis deviation. Most of these patients obviously have a significant ligamentous laxity that is a varus thrust which is there when they walk. And their mechanical axis typically passes from outside the joint line. So that is the first pointer which should tell you that this is not a regular case for osteotomy. This is not a regular virus knee. This is not a regular medial compartment osteoarthritis knee. So clinical appearance of significant virus and uh, mechanical axis which is passing outside the knee. 
The second important criterion is when you measure the angles. So you've got your scanogram done and now you've done your measurements. And in these cases where the mechanical axis is actually going practically through the edge of the medial tibial plateau, also you need to think in terms of a double osteotomy. So in this patient, we then go ahead, we know that the mechanical axis is passing medial to, uh, just at the edge of the medial tibial plateau. We then go with the angles. So what are the important angles? We look for the LDFA, we look for the MPTA, we look for the femorotibial axis, the mechanical femorotibial axis. So if you find that the LDFA is anything beyond 90 to 93 degrees, it should be a pointer that you cannot do the entire correction on the tibia. Otherwise, you're going to change the joint line obliquity. So an LDFA, which is beyond 92, 93 degrees, a mechanical axis, which is passing through the edge of the medial tibial plateau is another indicator where you need to know that this is a double level correction. Obviously, when there is significant joint line laxity, there is going to be an increase in the joint line congruence angle. So this patient, for example, has got significant varus. There's almost a 17 degree varus. There's a joint line congruence angle of about nine degree. All this, the joint line congruence laxity also has to be accounted into your correction. So these are the cases which should be pointers that this is, this is not a straightforward high tibial osteotomy case. This is the Bible for all of you who are in the beginning of your practice to start reading about osteotomies around the knee. And very clearly mentioned in this book is that not all deformities of RS are in the tibia. In fact, only 31% of the deformities are in the tibia. About percent are both in femur and tibia and about 50 percent or so are actually also in the femur so if you talk about osteotomies it is the hanover group which has said that 20 percent of their osteotomies for varus knee actually in, involve the distal femur so almost always these are the cases which we mentioned are having significant mechanical axis deviation or they are ldfas or on the higher side so about 20 percent of your of the osteotomies in this german group is actually involving the femur so what happens if you overcorrect the entire deformity on the tibia? So you need to understand the concept of joint line obliquity. As we know, the joint line obliquity is directed towards the medial side. That's how it normally is. In this patient, as you can see, there's a high lateral distal femoral angle. So if you do the entire correction on the tibia, you're going to land up shifting the mechanical axis, but in the process changing the joint line obliquity, in the process worsening your patient. Another example, typically this was done in the initial practices where we thought the entire correction can be done on the tibia, massive corrections like anything above 15 degree should always point out to you that the MPTA is now going to go way beyond the normal of 90, like in this case, where a 15 degree correction was done with significant opening of about 20 millimeters. The MPTA went all the way up to 100 degree, changing the joint line obliquity completely. So there is no so there is entire correction on the tibia and allowing the MPTA to go anything beyond 92 or 93 degrees on the higher side. These are my take home messages. So typically this is how a double osteotomy planning will look, wherein you divide your deformity correction in the femur and the tibia. So a typical say about 13 or 14 degree varus in this patient has been divided with seven degree in the femur and six degree in the tibia, such that the LDFA and the MPTA come into the normal ranges. I'll just discuss a few points in detail as to how you plan these cases in a simplified manner. Before that, just a quick revision, all of us know, where do you get your osteotomy line? Where do you get your mechanical axis to? We do not go to the Fujisawa point anymore. We go up to the 50 or the 55 percent line, which typically falls in the upslope of the medial tibial spine area or in the center of the knee. Unless there is significant uh, postlateral complex laxity or a significant bipolar chondral loss in the medial compartment in which you would look at the 55 or 60 percent point. So this is our patient again who has an LDFA of 95 degrees. He has a virus of about 14 degrees. His MPTA is about 84 degrees. You cannot do the traditional Miniachi planning in these patients. As we know, the traditional Miniachi planning involves identifying the hinge point, getting your mechanical access to the desired point, drawing lines from the hinge point to this new desired line, uh, measuring that angle and translating that angle on either the tibia or the femur uh, to get your corrections. However, this cannot be applied here because you're doing a double level correction. So simply first thing you need to do is account for the joint line congruence angle. If it is anything beyond two degrees, so let us say it is about nine degrees in this case, or if it is about five degrees in any case, you add two and divide by two. So that amount of correction has to be divided from your total correction. So in this case, 
it is 9 degrees so 9 plus 2 11 divided by 2 so about 5 to 6 degrees should be deducted from your total correction that's the first thing you need to do if you are planning a double level osteotomy you should target doing all this planning on a digital software like Promacad because that's the only way where you can dynamically do both the corrections. So you can do the medial opening wedge osteotomy and the digital femoral osteotomy and play with your mechanical axis. However, if it's not easily available, take a printout of your scanogram. As you see here, the mechanical axis is beyond the knee joint. You can divide your correction such that the deformity is divided between the femur and the tibia. Your LDFA, let us say in this case, was about 95 degree. You're planning to get it to around 89 degrees. So you can do your six uh, millimeter wedge and then just cut it uh, like you do, how you do traditionally. You just cut the correction to make sure that with doing this, the mechanical axis actually come into the medial joint line. The best thing about double level osteotomy is if you do your correction properly on the femur, you can always titrate it on the tibia to, to account for the one or two degree correction that you want to achieve. So coming back to this patient, I first planned a lateral closing wedge osteotomy. So that's the first thing you're going to do. So you get his LDFA from 95 degree to 89 degree by I planned a 7 mm wedge and then go ahead with the medial opening wedge osteotomy such that the MPTA is increased from the pre-existent 85, 86 degree to about 90 degree. So another 6 to 7 millimeter of correction on the tibia. So that's how I divided his 14 degree varus. Coming back to his clinical presentation, this is how he looks. So that's the varus thrust. This is a patient who is having an interesting finding on the x-ray. He has an exostosis because of which he was suffering from significant medial compartment pain. He is hardly 42 or 43 years of age. He was suffering for a, quite a few years and he is a manual uh, laborer kind of a person. He is working in the Indian railways. That's his mechanical axis. That's the normal side and that's the affected side. Those are the angles. That's the medial compartment where. That's the plan. So the first thing in the surgical technique now is that the patient is under tunique. The C arm is coming from the opposite side. We do the lateral distal femoral osteotomy first, the lateral incision, the fascia, identify the national lateralis, elevate it from the intermuscular septum, place a radiolucent retractor. So you, you do your dissection under the distal femur, place a radiolucent retractor. So Arthrex has got a wonderful radiolucent retractor which goes all the way on the medial side. You then place the plate. So typically for a closing wedge osteotomy, you have to use the medial plate of the opposite side. So for example, this is the medial plate of the right side, which is being used on the left side. You place it there, plan your osteotomy level with your cautery, place your guide wire. That is going to be the distal guide wire point. Place the guide wire. It is, we need to understand that the angle is not parallel to the joint line. So the spinal needle is actually at the part of the joint line. If you want to have an isosceles triangle such that when you close the gap, there is no step off, then you need to create an obliquity. The hinge point is just above the medial femoral condyle and you need to stop about 5 millimeters short of the medial cortex. So these are the points you need to remember when you pass this guide wire. Arthrex has got a very nice uh, offset guide which helps you to place a second guide wire exactly parallel to this guide wire. And then I place a, a cut uh, ruler to that 6 to 7 mm mark. You need to account for another millimeter for your saw blade. So if you're planning about 6 mm correction, go to the 7 mm because your saw blade is about a millimeter in width. And then you place a second wire in an oblique fashion such that it meets much before the hinge point. That is the, that is the take home message. So the two guide wires have been placed proximally and distally. Then you measure the guide wires and then you need to measure the uh, measurement from the, for the saw blade because you need to stop your saw blade about a few millimeters short of the hinge point. So in this case, I'm going to be uh, going up to the 55 millimeter point and that has been marked. You can cut the guide wire so that your assistant doesn't have to really bend those wires. You can place a finger at the point where you know you're going to stop. So at the 55 millimeter point, you can place your finger or you can do a good marking, continuously irrigate the uh, uh, during doing the sawing process so that there's no thermal necrosis. So you do the distal saw first, measure the uh, uh, planned uh, wedge again, and then take the proximal cut. Having taken this cut, so that's the, that's the uh, uh, wedge which is being created. So uh, the chisels are being used now to weaken the uh, wedge. You can also use a 2.4 mm guide wire to weaken the hinge because only then you can take a nice wedge of bone. So you can see your chisel being used to weaken the hinge point and uh, make the wedge pliable. 
So the wedge is getting pliable. And once you do that, you're able to take out a nice wedge of bone. This wedge will be used to close the gap in the medial opening wedge osteotomy. You then need to create a biplanar osteotomy. So your ascending cut is being created. This is created at the upper anterior one fourth level. You go through and through with your chisel then such that you create a tongue shaped ascending osteotomy. So the wedge has been taken and tongue shaped ascending osteotomy has been taken. This, this is helpful because you create a broader healing area. If you go through and through and if you break a hinge with the uh, entire construct getting unstable with the pull of the gastroc, it can become a nightmare. Even if you break the hinge and if you've done a biplane, you can actually stabilize it extremely well. So you then close the gap. Do not do any forceful maneuvers when you close the gap. Very gentle maneuvers. You actually can place a hinge pin now onto the opposite cortex, which actually protects your hinge point, And then you close the wedge. Place the plate then once you've closed the wedge. Fix it distally. Fix it provisionally proximally too. And then go ahead with your fixation. So the distal locking screws are placed. And then the golden screw is placed in the proximal combi hole to, to compress the construct. And that, that is how it looks. So the minute you do the distal femoral closing wedge, lateral closing wedge, osteotomy, the mechanical axis, as you see, has come into the inside the joint. You then go it with your traditional medial opening wedge osteotomy, and you can get it to the planned 50 or 55% point. In this case, I have used the peak power plate, and this is the post-operative. Here you can see the exostosis in the distal femur, which is probably responsible for the deformity in the femur for in this gentleman at such a young age. This is his three-month follow-up. So the alignment looks excellent. The healing happens very rapidly because in the femur, you've got a closing wedge and on the tibia, you actually put the graft there. So the healing is extremely good. The range of motion is excellent. This is a spinal follow up where we see excellent healing of both the femur and the tibia and excellent outcomes. A patient who was debilitated and suffering from medial compartment pain is now absolutely relieved with excellent alignment, no thrust. And uh, as I said, he was working in the Indian railways so it's, it's very gratifying to see that they are able to carry on with heavy workload also after having been completely compromised in their lifestyles. So that's his uh, alignment post-op. And you can see that the angles have been perfectly matched to the normal levels. So my take-home message, when, whenever you see that the mechanical axis is medial to the joint line or at the inner edge, think double level. Miniachi technique will not help you to plan. Divide the deformity between the femur and the tibia such that the angles fall into the normal range. Understand the principles of not changing the joint line obliquity or maintaining it and trying to understand that the JLCA should not be altered significantly. Do your lateral closing wedge osteotomy first. Typically, it's in the range of 7 to 9 millimeters and a medial opening wedge high table osteotomy in a titrated fashion next, wherein the correction is usually around 10 to 11 millimeters. Thank you. So really nice presentation, Dr. Shetia, and really impressive cases. I, I got two short questions uh, for you. The first is, are you starting in all of your cases on the femur and then go to the tibia? Or are there specific conditions which uh, make you start on the tibia first? I always start on the distal femur first. As, we, as you would agree, the distal femoral correction is always on the uh, smaller side and the titration of the larger correction can be done on the tibial side. The distal femur always first, the planned correction is achieved and then I can easily titrate whatever mechanical axis correction I want to do, I can easily titrate on the tibia and the graft from the femur can be used onto the tibia. Yeah, makes sense. So uh, next question is, since you, we are talking about really severe varus deformities in these double deformity patients, how do you deal with the contralateral side? Um, if it's asymptomatic, do you also recommend uh, realignment on the contralateral side? Because it's something that's something which every patient asks in my office, at least. Uh, usually, usually with these corrections, the patients are so gratified that uh, usually they will come back for the correction on the other side. We need to understand that the patient category is two: one who come for the significant pain, and the one who come for predominantly the cosmetic deformity. So I think the ones who are for the pain definitely would would come back for the other side too. And uh, in about four or five months, when the healing of these osteotomies occurs, they are good to go for the other side. Okay, and last, uh, maybe a short comment on rehabilitation. Do you make any differences in terms of rehabilitation compared to isolated HTOs? 
well not really because uh, in fact you are more secure here because uh, uh, you you've done a closing wedge on one side so range of motion straight away i am slightly conservative with my weight bearing because i i consider myself still early in my osteotomy career so i keep the non weight bearing for a varying duration of time between 4 to 6 weeks and then based on the radiological healing of the osteotomy progress such that they are full weight bearing in about 2 months to an afternoon Okay, so thank you really for this really impressive talk, and uh, it's a pleasure to hand over to Dr. Joseph, I guess now. Thank you, Dr. Philip. And he will be talking about our uh, ACL reconstruction and medial open wedge osteotomy, or are we going to the uh, Pudo surgical video first? Uh, Tom, may yeah, you might uh, help me with that. We can now see that Dr. IPS's presentation is up. So, Dr. IPS, if you're ready to go with this, I think we can we can we can jump onto this, right? Absolutely. Thank you. I think Ruchir, if you can run the presentation, it's uh, it's showing on the desktop. I speak as you run the presentation at your end, Ruchir. Sure, sir. Sir, uh, is is the screen visible, sir? Yeah, the screen is visible. You need to play. Yeah. Yes. So whenever you, yeah, I'm, I'm so really ready. Yeah, please. Yes. Sir. Not playing yet. Is the screen visible? Is it on the play mode? Not yet. It's, uh... No, Richard. You may have to go through each slide individually, perhaps, if it's not going to play. Okay. Is it now playing? Yeah, but it's not on the full screen, Rocher. Okay, I'm set. Sorry. So it's not playing. So you go slide by slide. How does that happen? I think it's showing play on my side once. Yeah, yeah. is it better? Better. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, uh, uh, friends. I think Ruchir is going to run the presentation while I speak from this side. Uh, the basic concepts and principles of osteotomy has well been uh, uh, demonstrated by uh, Dr. Philip, and a combination of both uh, distal femoral osteotomy and an upper tibial osteotomy, double osteotomy, has been well shown by Nagaraj. i think uh, uh, what my uh, topic here essentially is uh, 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 the surgical video presentation of um, uh, a yet another uh, osteotomy fixation device which is a pudu plate uh, the first slide here shows a incision mark uh, i usually surface mark these uh, knees whenever we are doing an upper tibial osteotomy it's an oblique incision which runs from the tibial tubercle going obliquely up towards the posterior medial cortex of the tibia Uh, the skin flap is raised and medial collateral ligament the superficial part is exposed uh, next slide please proceed next slide yeah yeah marking the osteotomy side yes sir no we we can't see the first slide is visible we not seeing the second slide next one yeah so once the uh, mcl is slightly elevated and uh, the posterior cortex is identified uh, guide wires are passed from around 6 cm down from the medial tibial plateau towards the superior tibiofibular joint so that's an oblique guide wire which is running from medial to the lateral side uh, parallel guide wires are placed one behind the other and you do have a wonderful device now to uh, pass in parallel guide wires and these wires go towards the superior tibiofibular joint and we just just stop short there next slide please so as these tibial osteotomies are double osteotomies this is the first limb of osteotomy is actually running from medial to the lateral side the second limb is perpendicular to it which is going behind the tibial tubercle it's at around 90 to 100 degrees an oblique osteotomy which is a double osteotomy so that's the second limb of the osteotomy which is that Next slide. The osteotomy is then uh, done with help of a oscillating saw blade, which goes towards the second cortex. We just stop short of second cortex, and we do not do not cut the second cortex because this would eventually make uh, the tibia unstable. 
The second limb is, as I told, an oblique osteotomy, which is going anteriorly behind the tibial tubercle, just short of ligamentum patelli. And this is the second limb of the osteotomy. Next slide. Once we think we have, once we think we have uh, uh, done the osteotomy, we need to open this osteotomy. And the best way to open such osteotomy is using stacked osteotome. So one osteotome over the other is used. This would gradually deform and open the osteotomy. And these multiple stack osteotomes help us in opening the osteotomy without breaking the second cortex and thus the osteotomy is stable. Once the osteotomy has been opened, you do have wedge which is available depending upon how much osteotomy which you have calculated you need to open. You can put in a wedge to stabilize the open part of the osteotomy. Next slide. As Dr. Philip rightly said, there are multiple indications. We just don't even do only for medial OANE, but often osteotomy is also combined slope, slope alteration. And these slope alterations are much important in patients which come to us with hyperextension thirst. Because in these patients, there is always an increase in the tibial slope in the sagittal plane. And this actually reduces, uh, so you have to change the slope and increase the slope in the sagittal plane so as to reduce the hyperextension thirst. Next slide, please. And thus, whenever you're opening the osteotomy, you can use a laminar spreader or a block to open osteotomy and stabilize it. And if you want to alter the slope, you might need to open the osteotomy more anteriorly than posteriorly so as to take care of the hyperextension uh, thirst. Next slide. Uh, can you run the video if it is possible? This is a video. Uh, uh, see if you can, can run. Yeah, one sec. Yeah, please. So all the steps which were. Yeah. Click again. It's not running. So all the steps which were shown uh, by the pictures are. Uh, sorry. So that was an oblique concision which we had already shown after surface marking. That's a superficial medial collateral ligament. You gently elevate the superficial MCL. Uh, guide wire is passed from the medial to the lateral side. It's an oblique guide wire which is going towards the medial cortex, towards the lateral cortex, just stopping short of the superior tibiofibular joint. A narrow saw blade is used to complete both the limbs of osteotomy, one going medial to lateral, the second one perpendicular, uh, nearly 110 degrees to the primary, primary osteotomy, just behind the tibial tubercle. This is the second limb of osteotomy. And then stacked osteotomes are used, as I told you. This is an osteotome, one, another one, and then the third one. And as the wedged osteotome, the third one is used, the osteotomy starts to open up. You can confirm the opening of osteotomy by looking under the CR. So this is how a plastic deformation of osteotomy happens and gradual opening happens without the loss of bone and also without the loss of lateral cortex integrity. And the stacked osteotome is a good idea. The osteotomy correction is assessed on a CRM intensifier and you see how much osteotomy opening you have already achieved. Next slide, please. As we told about different fixation devices, Pudu plate is also a very great fixation device. The advantage of Pudu plate is that it is an inherently very stable device. Also, it has got a small cortical wedge, which actually wedges between the osteotomy. And so primary stability is very good. These wedges are available both in rectangular and trapezoidal fashion, which means that if you need to alter the tibial slope, this implant is excellent implant which can change the tibial slope and keep the osteotomy stabilized. Next slide, please. So that's how uh, an osteotomy is kept open with a laminar spreader. If the osteotomy is big, you can use an HA block and these HA blocks are commercially available which can be put into the osteotomy site. Next slide. And the plate is applied onto that and fixed with screws. Next slide, please. 
So you do have four screws, two going proximally, two going distally, and this gives a primarily uh, stable uh, uh, fixation. Next slide. Again, the video, if it runs, uh, it shows all these steps. So once these stacked osteotomes are placed, now you start removing the stacked osteotomes. You have already checked your osteotomy is correct. Your angles are achieved. And uh, once correction has been achieved, you remove these stacked osteotomes and then use a purdue blade. So that's a 7.5 mm wedge which is inst installed. You usually keep the plate more posteriorly than anteriorly. This gives the primary stability to the implant as well because it has got a small wedge and you can actually wedge in that small wedge into that. The opening in between the osteotomy can be stabilized by putting a small HA block in between the bones as well. And you can appreciate the opening both anteriorly and from medial to lateral side, both the planes of osteotomy. So keeping the osteotomy stabilized, washing it, and then putting a small HA wedge, and then putting the implant, fixing it with screws, two screws going proximally, and two going distally. And if you can look into the X-ray, it doesn't break the lateral cortex. It corrects the osteotomy by plastic deformation of the lateral cortex. So screws are being placed proximally and distally. This is an excellent fixation device because we can allow early mobility to the patients with this kind of plate fixation device. It's a very low profile plate, uh, does not hurt under the thin skin. And uh, healing is good because you don't damage too much of soft tissue structures around. Next slide, please. The pest sincereness and the MCL is moved back and that small incision is closed over a small drain. Next slide, please. So that was a pre-operative and a post-operative X-ray of a patient where osteotomy was done. Next slide. So as you see, these osteotomies need small protection and a hinge brace for around six weeks or so. We can immediately allow touch tone weight bearing in for six weeks. And gradually, these patients go back into full weight bearing by end of around 12 weeks, which is the time usually evidence of union does happen. Next slide. As rightly pointed out by Dr. Philip, there is important caution that osteotomy displacement would happen if the lateral cortex is broken. And Pudu plate has a disadvantage that it actually cannot hold when this kind of displacement does happen. And then you might need to add in a screw or an add-on plate onto the lateral sides. So this is an important caution which you need to know whenever you are doing an osteotomy using this device. Next slide. So the conclusion is that these osteotomies in the tibia does correct both coronal and sagittal plane deformities. But these are open wedge osteotomies which preserve the bone stock. Because we do not disturb the proximal tibiofibular joint, it's an inherently stable osteotomy. You never damage peroneal nerve because you're always medial. And it also does not violate any muscle compartment in the anterior part of the knee. It tightens the lateral uh, capsular ligamentous structures, thus taking these patients, making their knee much more stable. And the last slide. So this plate is minimally invasive. And as we showed, you can actually allow early weight bearing and early joint motion with this stable device. You can exactly open the osteotomy. And more important, no secondary collapse would happen because you got a small wedge which is in place. So we have been using this device with an excellent result. The only caution, as I told you, is not to break the lateral cortex because that would inherently make the implant unstable. Last slide. Thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, listening to this presentation. Thank you. Also, thank you for this nice presentation. It's really uh, impressive uh, pictures from the OR. So, so what are you specifically doing once you observe a lateral hinge fracture during the surgery? Do you change to another implant or do you decide to go for a fixation of the lateral cortex additionally? How do you react? Uh, so you do have both the options. Uh, the easier option is that once you have already opened this implant, you don't want to actually go ahead and change an implant. So you add on a lateral fixation device. Uh, you can add on a small plate or a screw fixation to the lateral cortex, and that is usually enough. Uh, there are sometimes patients which are heavy-built patients where you think 
you don't want to actually take a chance and then you would actually change the implant uh, from this i usually change it to a tomo fix device and what is your actually weight limit for for this kind of uh, small plate so we go by around 90 uh, 90 between 90 kgs to around 100 kgs is one which is good enough we are happy with this kind of device anything above that something goes in for either a, a a peak power plate or a, a, a tomo fixed device. Hmm. I actually have a, another question which is specific to your Indian situation. So in Germany, implant removal is quite popular. But to be honest, uh, also with the power peak plate, we have some patients with local irritation, but they usually get rid of this irritation once the plate is removed. How is this tradition in India? Do you leave this pudu plate in place? I've been putting pudu plates from last uh, around 16 to 17 years. I have removed just four of them, which means that patients are not very keen on getting them removed. Sometimes some patients are a bit more uh, keen, they would go ahead and remove it. But being a low profile plate uh, usually doesn't cause uh, irritation as much as Tomofix used to do with the patients. So thanks really for your nice presentation. So, so um, I now hand over to Dr. Joseph uh, for the second time. So uh, sorry for this misleading introduction earlier, um, but now I'm really looking forward to your presentation because the combination of ACL and HTO is something which, which is uh, needed really frequent. And on the other hand side, it's also technical challenging and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nimer, and uh, thanks, uh, Atrex and Avna, for this uh, opportunity. We all know that the repeated instability episodes of ACL can lead to meniscal tear, especially medial meniscal tear and medial cartilage injuries, which can eventually result in medial joint osteoarthritis. This medial joint osteoarthritis can lead to a virus deformity, which can be accentuated by a pre-existing constitutional or a physiological virus. And also, if the patient happens to have a postrolateral coronary injury, the virus can really be a problem. What is more important is the virus deformity per se can put a lot of stress on an ACL graft. If you choose to neglect this deformity and go ahead with an ACL graft, your graft can be under a lot of stress and it can result in a failure. With this background, let us go to the biomechanics deficiency. The virus deformity can lead to increased constant adduction moment, especially when you're walking, it can add to a dynamic adduction moment, which can increase the medial joint pressure. It can stretch the lateral structures, which can also put a lot of stress on your ACLs. In addition, the ACL deficient knee can have an altered gait, can have a decreased flexion moment. It can also increase the external knee adduction which uh, can actually increase the incidence of an osteoarthritis. When you look at the biomechanics of H, the medial joint contact pressures, it decreases the stress on the lateral structures and it decreases the adduction moment and it has got a very, very beneficial effect on a, a ligamentous deficient and a virus knee. But it's surprising when you go through an earlier literature, uh, ACL deficiency was uh, deemed to be a contraindication for H2O, but we know now that uh, high tibial osteotomy plays a very crucial role in the management of uh, neglected injuries, especially with malalignment. Let's go through the first part where we deal with indications for this combined procedure. When uh, there was early reports of combined procedure, especially this paper by uh, Roland Jacob, uh, we used to discuss three groups of patients, patients uh, with ACL and uh, virus malalignment with osteoarthritis. Uh, what is their presenting symptom, whether they have pain as a predominant symptom or instability or both? And we were also taking into consideration the age of the patient and the activity level of the patient. Many times for an elderly patient with uh, less instability, an H2O will be offered and younger patients with uh, more of instability and pain and then who needs to go back 
tactile wear of what ACL and uh, osteotomy as a combined procedures. When we started doing this as uh, combined procedures, a lot of questions. Uh, we used to ask whether ACL reconstruction will increase the incidence of osteoarthritis, if there have been increase in complications when you combine both these procedures, whether these patients will be able to return to sports. So this always used to be a question in our mind which to offer to these patients. But now, um, this is an interesting paper from uh, uh, Julian Mill uh, and also from Andrea Imhoff. Uh, they have compared 26 uh, patients who underwent H2 and 26 uh, patients who had both this. Interestingly, H2 alone was found to improve pain and even subjective knee instability in many of the patients. And uh, they also found out that adding an ACL reconstruction was not associated with a higher incidence of osteoarthritis or a higher rate of post-operative complications in our study. So very important thing to take home from this uh, uh, paper is the high tibial osteotomy is a crucial element uh, when you are treating these patients who have this combined malleal element and ACL ligament deficiency. And uh, second question is to what stage of arthritis we can do uh, a high tibial osteotomy? Can it be done in advanced stages? So this is an interesting paper in which high tibial osteotomy with ACL reconstruction along with microfracture for knees who have more than grade three and four Kelgen, Kelgen Lorenz arthritis. And uh, these knees were followed up uh, without arthroplasty for five years. And the revision arthroplasty is done in almost 22 knees. They had four graft failures, uh, but surprisingly, they found the clinical outcome to be uh, significantly improved. And uh, they shown that these combined procedures can be effective even in advanced stages of osteoarthritis. And the arthroscopy showed uh, even Even cartilages were able to regenerate following this unloading surgery. So this is an uh, encouraging study to, uh, you know, encourage us to do osteotomies even in advanced stages of osteoarthritis in young people along with ACL reconstruction. And uh, we always never used to guarantee that uh, a combined procedure can result in return to sports. But this is an interesting study from uh, the team of uh, Pascal Bolu, yeah. which showed that these patients can successfully return to a high level of sports. The primary indication for uh, these patients should be an ACL deficient knee. Uh, the second indication will be looking at a postrolateral knee injury along with an ACL injury. These patients typically have a lateral joint opening and uh, they also have a recurvatum deformity in some cases, which is called as a triple virus. So these are the patients who will benefit with the combined procedure. We don't have to do even PLC reconstruction also. The osteotomy itself will compensate for the lateral and postural soft tissue deficiency. The third indication would be uh, the revision ACL. Here you can see this is a patient who underwent a ACL uh, reconstruction in which the varus knee and the varus thrust was neglected. He came back uh, with a uh, failed ACL reconstruction. So whenever you are facing a situation of revision, it's very important to assess uh, not only the coronal plane deformity and also to assess the tibial slope in these patients. And HTO can offer opportunity to correct the tibial slope as well as uh, coronal plane deformities in these patients. So then we'll go uh, to the second part of my talk, which is an illustrative case. The steps which I follow in this combined procedures are I do a scopy, do a femoral canal drilling, then mark the tibial tunnel. I drill only with a bead pin so that to identify the location of the tibial entry point. Then I perform the high tibial osteotomy, place the plate as posterior as possible, fix the proximal posterior screw and the distal uh, screws, and uh, check for tunnel coalition with the, the marked tunnel. And if there is a possibility of a tunnel coalition, make a new trajectory and keep the final drill bit inside the tibial tunnel. So keeping the tibial drill bit inside the tunnel, the proximal screws are applied so as you skip the tibial tunnel uh, while drilling. So, so we place all the screws, uh, then arthroscopically, you can also inspect the tibial tunnel to make sure that none of the threads are protruding into the tunnel, then finally you can pass the graft. So first and foremost, a proper scanogram with a magnification marker is very important. So we can use uh, one of the software uh, available for uh, your planning. I use uh, the Osteomaster software available in the iPad. And uh, this is a case, uh, this is a 55 year old male who underwent uh, near total meniscectomy, came with uh, pain and instability. A preliminary arthroscopy revealed a cartilage 
actually was a plan for a next uh, deferred procedure of a cartilage repair and osteotomy in ACL reconstruction. Femoral tunnel is made, tibial tunnel is smart. You can see the bead pin and uh, uh, inverted L-shaped insertion is started uh, a centimeter below the joint level here. The first step is to identify the lateral margin of the uh, patellar tendon and identify the exact point where it is inserting into the tibial tunnel. You can see the upper limb of the incision. The entire soft tissue sleeve is uh, marked and elevated off the tibia. This is the layer containing the hamstrings as well as the MCL, which is being elevated off the proximal tibia. And using a blunt retractor, the MCL is slowly peeled off the tibia so that you gain access to the postremedial aspect of the tibia. Here we are releasing the septum and using blunt dissection, the entire uh, posterior uh, space is steroid. Our aspirate is taken for a cartilage repair. So this is the first guide wire going through between the uh, aiming towards the fibula head between the tip of the fibula head and the epiphyseal marking. Parallel wires are inserted using the parallel drip guide. And then, then the scoring is done uh, on the uh, to start the osteotomy. The second biplane is marked. The radio opaque uh, uh, retractor is uh, inserted using the saw. The posterior tibial cut is made first is gone as far back as possible. Then the anterior cut and anterior tethering is uh, released. And then the biplane osteotomy is uh, completed by the help of saws and osteotomes. So this is the image. An arthroscopy is carried out without opening the osteotomy. The cartilage uh, defect is drilled and uh, the bone marrow aspirate concentrate is used to repair the defect. Uh, at this stage, once the clot is nicely formed, then we come back to your osteotomy. The osteotomy is opened with multiple osteotomes and a wedge to open to the desired level. And keeping a uh, laminar spreader, uh, the opening is uh, kept. And uh, using a long extension rod, it is counter checked. So we know uh, now the axis is shifted just. Uh, uh, you see the first mark tunnel is very close to the plate. So anyhow, we are putting the proximal posterior screw first and also we are inserting the distal two screws of this podu plate. And then now you just keep the TPL drill inside. So because it is too close to the plate, we are uh, doing a new tunnel much more laterally and keeping the TPL drill bit inside, the screws are inserted. And once you are sure that there are no screw threads protruding into the joint, into the tunnel, the graft is passed and fixed with a, uh, bioabsorbable screw. So this is a final x-ray following a combined ACL reconstruction and a high tibial osteotomy. So coming to the important to know that you're going to place uh, the tibial tunnel avoiding a lot of screws uh, in the proximal segment of the osteotomy. Uh, many times you, if you're using a plate with four proximal screws like uh, Arthrex peak plate or Tomafix, you may have to skip one screw and you may have to place the screw uh, plate very posteriorly and also keep the anterior screws short. Sometimes you can get away with using a pudu type of plate which has got only two screws in the proximal and distal segment or you can use a plate like this peak power uh, which gives you a wider uh, range of uh, direction changes uh, when compared to a Tomo fixed plate. And uh, it's very important to do the biplane osteotomy in this cases, so you have a good amount of bone to have a long tibial tunnel, and also you have good amount of space to change uh, in case uh, if it's required. And it's very important in these cases to avoid increasing the tibial slope, which can put a lot of stress on your ACL graft. So it's a known fact that opening wedge osteotomy has a tendency to increase the uh, closing, uh, uh, increase the tibial slope, and the closing wedge osteotomy uh, vice versa can decrease your scope. And uh, uh, this is one example which uh, mistake we made. Uh, the patient had a constitutional virus from birth, it's a severe metaphyseal virus deformity. He had a ACL injury. We did a combined procedure. A gross opening has been done here, but uh, only to have a very uh, increased slope. Even though the patient is asymptomatic, uh, we have been following for the last three years. But this is uh, one thing which uh, you need to avoid. So the way you can avoid uh, is using uh, two techniques, uh, one described by Anil Ranawat group, where uh, you take your osteotomy cut well posteriorly all the way and keep your hinge more in the anterolateral aspect. So you'll be opening the aspect of the osteotomy than the anterior aspect. 
The second technique which I come across is a, a constraining staple in which uh, when you're opening the ostotomy, uh, this group by Lavo et al, they have done a staple. They put a staple anteriorly so that the anterior opening doesn't happen. All the opening uh, uh, happens at the back of the tibia. Uh, which thereby ensures that you are actually decreasing the slope than increasing the slope. Uh, one should have interference screws as well as a backup fixation in the form of buttons and pillar posts for your tibial uh, fixation for your graft. The other complications one you should be aware of uh, is a hinge fracture. If there is a hinge fracture, better to go for an angularly stabilized implant like this. And uh, we have to be very careful when opening the fracture. One can use a hinge wire as well as uh, using a screw is also an option. Uh, it's always important to uh, drill the tibial tunnel after you perform the osteotomy. If you if you do the uh, tibial tunneling before HTO opening, your osteotomy uh, fracture can propagate into the joint. Or if you're revising a uh, previously done ACL, you have to be very careful because when you're opening your osteotomy, the previous tunnel uh, can propagate the fracture into the joint. And patella baja is uh, usually due to poor rehabilitation, early moment, and achieving 90 degree within a week is very crucial to avoid this complication. Uh, when you are using an angularly stable fixator, uh, we can start immediate partial weight bearing and range of movement to achieve 90 degrees is, is done within a week and full range of movement should be achieved by three weeks and full weight bearing will be started by around six to eight weeks time. But when you are using a puddu plate, you have to be a bit careful. So I usually put them on non-weight bearing. Radiologically, probably start partial weight bearing from six weeks and full weight bearing can take at least uh, 10 to 12 weeks also. So to conclude, uh, ACL and combined with an osteotomy is a rewarding procedure if, if the patient has got the right indications. It's very important to execute it perfectly and the rehabilitation uh, is very key for this procedure. Once again, I thank uh, Arthrex and uh, team Avana for this opportunity. Uh, over to you, Dr. Nimea. Thank you. So, Dr. Joseph, also thank you for this really interesting uh, presentation. You actually mentioned that you are doing the tibia drill hole after opening the osteotomy. Can you just uh, paraphrase in one sentence how, how your uh, sequential steps are during the surgery? So, first atroscopy or first osteotomy? Uh, when do you do the femoral tunnel and uh, when uh, exactly the tibial tunnel? I start with arthroscopy and uh, harvest the graft. Depending on the graft diameter, I do the femoral tunneling and I do all the intraarticular work like meniscal repair, meniscectomy, everything. And then I do the tibial tunnel, but I don't make the tunnel, but I just pass a bead pin so that I know where my tibial tunnel is going to start from the tibial side and probably mark that entry with a diathermy mark. Then I come back to the osteotomy part I just do the osteotomy and open the osteotomy. In this case, I had to do a scopy between because I didn't want to do the cartilage repair earlier. But if I'm doing only ACL with osteotomy, uh, I will uh, do the osteotomy, open it, put a plate with the posterior screws and the distal screws. And uh, if uh, you are worried about propagating a fracture, what I will do is I'll put a very short length anterior screw, like 25 millimeter or 20 millimeter. And then I will see whether I will be able to use my previously marked tunnel. If uh, this screw is not violating my previously marked tunnel, probably I'll just pass a bead pin and finish off my TBL uh, reaming at that time. But if the screws are very close to my marking, in case I need to shift, so I do a scopy at this time, but very carefully somebody supporting the leg, and I go there and uh, use the TB aiming device but I now change the entry point from the tibia, make a new entry point on the tibial and make a tunnel. And then what I do, I ream up to the desired diameter. I leave the drill bit inside the tibial tunnel and then I put the screw because uh, I don't want that screw threads to come inside uh, the tibial tunnel. I have seen that happen a few times. So if you are leaving the uh, tibial drill bit inside, uh, the, your screws have to skip the drill bit so you don't have any chance of uh, uh, irritating or rupturing your graft later. So I put all the screws and then I make sure that uh, the tibial tunnel is free of any metal. Then I pass the graft uh, and fix it. So thank you for this additional comment. We are, we are running a little bit over time. That's why I just hand over to Dr. Zabnes. And we are now, or he will be talking about lateral distal femoral osteotomy 
which is also an important uh, topic and we have not heard about that during this session and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Nima, and uh, thanks all of you. Uh, can you hear me and can you see the screen well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm Bhushan Sabnis. I, uh, I, I'm a knee surgeon based in Mumbai, and uh, this is something which is slightly unusual, a lateral distal femoral osteotomy, and this is becoming rather more common in our armamented team now that we are more confident and comfortable doing uh, femoral osteotomies. So here is uh, my uh, take on LDFO as such. So we all heard this before. It's all about getting the alignment perfect. We all know this uh, picture from Dror Pelle's book about how the uh, uh, MLDFA and MPT are the important angles around the need to get your alignment perfect. And uh, opening wedge HTO uh, is, is a different procedure because you are protected by your fibular collateral ligament attachment, the proximal tibio fibular joint ligaments, which give a good support to your HTO on the other side. This doesn't work that well for a medial uh, femoral osteotomy where there is not much of attachment at the hinge point. So there is no soft tissue support. As against that, for a LDFO, if you remember, remember your anatomy of the medial side of the knee joint, there are those three tubercles, the gastroc tubercle, the adductor tubercle, and the medial epicondyle. And there's a, a big meshwork of uh, ligament and soft tissue support on the medial side of the knee. So this works similar to what would happen on the uh, lateral side of, uh, for the HTO. Uh, that's why LDFO is slightly more stable, in my opinion, as compared to uh, a medial uh, DFO as such. Now, closing this has generally been a preferred surgery for femoral side, mainly because... Uh, uh, it's a very powerful surgery and it always heals. There's rarely a chance of having a non-union for a, a closing wedge DFO, but chances of hinge fracture are quite high. And all of us who have been doing DFOs, medial closing wedge DFO have always had, uh, uh, always have skipped our heartbeat a few times. Every time you felt your assistant closing it too tight or when you felt a sudden snap on the uh, lateral side and you saw the hinge break. You most of the times are able to compensate with a good plate on the medial side, but there's always a worry that it might slip and there's always a problem of uh, uh, collapse of the osteotomy or of displacement, which might lead to a worsening of the deformity as such. So when do we go for, uh, why should we go for an opening wedge DFO? In this case, we're talking of lateral opening wedge DFO. We're talking of uh, valgus arthritis and that usually is generally associated with a lateral femoral condyle hypoplasia. If you uh, recollect Professor Nima's uh, uh, talk, you remember that uh, the, t the, the proximal tibial varus angle be between the epiphyseal line and the joint line, that there's narrowing on the medial side in medial compartment arthritis, and a, a similar analogy can be applied where the lateral side has loss of bone uh, as compared to the medial side. So naturally thinking, the easiest way to compensate for this will be to open uh, a wedge on the lateral side to compensate for this hypoplasia and you can get a better alignment. So it does make sense doing a lateral opening wedge distal femoral osteotomy. Another key indication for doing a LDFO is whenever you're doing a derotation osteotomy. I do a fair number of derotation osteotomies and this has been my preferred approach to uh, distal femur. Uh, it's, it's a pretty straightforward approach. Of course, uh, we heard about uh, Nagaraj talk about uh, double osteotomy. Anytime a person has shortening on that side, I would hesitate to do a closing wedge osteotomy and I would rather go for an opening wedge osteotomy. Of course, there are issues with skin problems and scars on the medial side and you have to go for a lateral side. Uh, LDFO can also be done for, uh, for patients who have lateral meniscal uh, transplants or implants where you need to uh, offload the lateral compartment and also for uh, repeat uh, failures of MCL repairs or reconstructions where you need to offload the lateral compartment. It can be a medial closing wedge or a uh, lateral opening wedge, but whenever you're doing an MCL repair, there's already a lot of metal work on the medial side, so it's better to go for the lateral DFO as such. So this is the same, uh, 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 this is the image, the key image that you always want to see where your hinge is intact, you opened it nicely on the lateral side and your uh, your uh, Mikulis point is coming towards the 50% mark. We normally aim for about 47% when you're trying to uh, uh, offload the lateral compartment. 
A couple of papers which are really impressive. This is uh, 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 a very good paper about uh, lateral opening wedge technique, which talks in details about the procedural techniques as such. Uh, Rob Laprade has given a very good paper about uh, the effects of a lateral opening wedge DFO, and it's really a good paper. And another paper from uh, I think Mayo Clinic, which talks uh, 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 in great details about uh, LDFO as a surgery. Uh, uh, in arthroscopy techniques, it's a good video to see as well. So those of who are interested, you can uh, quickly have a look. So we all heard about how to plan the surgery, and you can use a miniature technique, or you can use a simple technique where you can join uh, the mechanical axis of femur and tibia, and uh, find the angle of deformity and extrapolate that from the hinge point to decide the correction that you want. Most of us now have moved to uh, either a trauma CAD planning or osteo master planning, where we uh, digitally plan the osteotomy. And if you can see here, this is about seven millimeter opening osteotomy on the lateral side, and that will get the leg back into a proper alignment. So uh, important to have a proper planning done. But one more thing is that you can dial the osteotomy on table. So if you're not happy with your planning, uh, if you are if you have made a mistake in your planning, unlike a closing wedge osteotomy where there's not much of room to play with, uh, for an opening wedge osteotomy you can you can easily increase or reduce the correction that you're achieving to get the perfect alignment. Uh, the procedure is fairly simple. The lateral distal femur is sitting in front of you. All you need to do is just make a cut in the skin. Now I normally don't cut the iliotibial band. I like to go anterior to the iliotibial band. This was a trick taught to me by. Uh, Fengua from Beijing when I was visiting him, God bless his soul. And uh, uh, it just makes life so easy. You don't have to struggle with your ITB. Just bend the knee slightly and the ITB falls posteriorly. And you have the whole distal, lateral distal femur in front of you. Dissect the posterior part of the uh, uh, periosteum very, very slowly and very carefully because the neurovascular band is sitting very close to the lateral aspect and make sure that you put a, a homan or a big retractor underneath to protect them. Then you pass uh, a couple of parallel guide wires as you would normally do, uh, followed by a standard osteotomy. Now the hinge point of the osteotomy is on the medial side about 5 to 10 millimeters from the cortex and generally because of the uh, li strong ligamentous and soft tissue network on the medial side, it's a pretty stable osteotomy in my opinion. You you pass your uh, osteotomes to gradually open it. I always do a biplanar osteotomy. It works in two ways. One is you're not violating the patellofemoral joint. And secondly, you can go way down to get a good metaphyseal bone and not be in a diaphyseal uh, uh, femur as such. So first pass a guide wire. As you see, that's the hinge point that is marked. Then you pass your uh, saw on top of the guide wire and then you open it slowly in a standard way as you would do in your HTO. Uh, you can indeed pass a hinge pin. I sometimes put a staple on the medial side if I'm worried about it. Uh, I have thought or I have toyed, toyed with the idea of putting a, uh, uh, a Herbert kind of screw on the medial side, but uh, fortunately haven't required to do it yet. But I would not be averse from putting a fixation on the medial side if I'm not if I'm worried about my uh, uh, about my hinge point as such. So that's your uh, DFO peak plate, lateral DFO peak plate, uh, which works brilliantly. Now you need to put the plate on the bone before you decide on the osteotomy. The plate is designed with Caucasian uh, people in mind, so it's in petite Indian patients. It might you might need to alter the level of osteotomy, as you can see in this patient, where the osteotomy has been proximalized slightly to compensate for the plate geometry as such. But a peak plate gives a very good fixation and it gives you uh, a, a good view of how the consolidation is happening with time because it's not blocking your view. Uh, those of you who are keen-eyed can actually see a hinge fracture, but funnily enough, uh, two weeks of non it, it it went on to heal perfectly fine. A few tips and tricks. It's a very easy approach from the lateral side. Just go enter to the ITB. Neurovascular bundle, as I said, it's not neuromuscular, neurovascular, sorry about the typo, is more lateral. So be very, be very careful in your lateral dissection. Uh, it's just sitting very close to the bone there. So release it properly. Always do bipolar osteotomy because you need uh, you need to have a good hold on the femur. If you do a unipolar osteotomy, you get a very bad unstable femur, which will need a fixator for sure. Uh, I generally uh, use bone graft for any open osteotomies, but that's entirely up to you. The femur tends to heal usually as long as you're cooling down your saw 
and you're not uh, causing thermal necrosis. Uh, there's not much a matter of slope, so you can do a rectangular opening, and it's important to have an angle stable secure fixation, which can be achieved with your Arthrix uh, uh, LDFO plate. That's a small uh, uh, optic video by Arthrix guys, and you can indeed see a standard procedure as you would normally do in your HTO. Just extrapolate that to your uh, femoral side, do a standard bipolar osteotomy, use your osteotomes as standard to open uh, the osteotomy very gently. You can stack your osteotomes. Uh, uh, always be a bit slow on the femur. Femur is a very strong bone as compared to the tibia. Once you open the osteotomy to desired level, you put a uh, a wedge and a laminar spray to hold the position uh, and then you place your uh, LDFO plate and fix it in a standard way. Uh, you may or may not want to use this uh, sheet on top. Uh, you get four screws distally and four screws proximally. I normally use a golden screw to compress the plate, but it's not imperative. I always make, an, uh, make a conscious effort to change this screw to a locking screw. I feel there is no role for a cortical screw in the locking system. So all locking screws at the end and you get a, a brilliant fixation as such. Now why use a LDFO peak plate? The main advantage of this plate is the 12 degrees of variation that you get in your screw alignment. So. Uh, if you want to push the plate more distally, you can. You can align the screws in such a way that they are away from the osteotomy and getting the maximum purchase in the bone. Uh, if you are very brave and you are doing a ligament reconstruction, along with this, you can alter the screws geometry in such a way that your tunnels won't uh, come into the screw trajectory. And uh, it just gives a very good stable fixation in general. Now, if you... So if I just go back, you can see the position of the plate. Now, if we use the uh, titanium plate, you see how close to the joint uh, the lateral plate is. And unfortunately, that does cause a lot of irritation of the iliotibial band as it crosses from uh, uh, crosses along the trajectory of my, my mouse here. So you will need this plate to be removed very often as against that uh, uh, an LDFO plate generally can stay in forever without any issues as such. Uh, a few examples. So uh, as uh, Clement said, uh, you can use uh, uh, a, a, a medial sided plate of the opposite side from synthesis kit for, the, uh, uh, for your lateral fixation. The only worry is, I don't know if it's covered by insurance, if there anything happens up, uh, with the failure of the plate, because it's, it's only designed for a medial side. Uh, fortunately, we don't have that much of worry in India about it, but that uh, probably Professor Nima can tell us about it, uh, uh, about the seriousness about this. So that's the opening that you have achieved on a lateral side. A couple of examples, the same one. Now, this patient was so happy with her uh, uh, LDFO, she refused to have another scanogram, so I had to extrapolate that to actually see how it looks now. So it gives a really good fixation and uh, uh, results as such. Now I do a, a bit of derotation work as well, and this is my standard approach for the lateral side. The only difference is my osteotomy is more uh, parallel to the joint as compared to an oblique osteotomy that uh, you would make. So I do this normal biplanar cut, and I use that double biplane cut in the uh, osteotomy to open it more on the valgus as compared to uh, uh, as compared to the medial side. So I'm actually doing an opening wedge osteotomy on the lateral side along with derotation at the same time and fixing it with the plate on top. So it works quite well to have this approach. These are the basic steps for a varization plus uh, derotation osteotomy uh, DFO for patella instability as such. And uh, that's just how it looks uh, when you're derotating the, the femur. Uh, along with changing the alignment as such. Okay. So I think uh, uh, LDFO is a very powerful surgery and it gives a really uh, good fixation uh, and it is a good uh, tool in your armamentarium to try and uh, incorporate in your normal day-to-day -day practice. Thank you. Yeah, also thank you for your presentation, very impressive. So we are, we are also doing a lot of these lateral opening osteotomies. But one of the limitations in, in our practice is the amount of varus correction because we are afraid of tensioning the iliotibial band uh, just too much. Um, can you maybe comment on that? Do you observe any problems in the iliotibial band or uh, do you think this is not really an issue? So uh, 
I haven't had any issue yet for a ITB band tightness. Uh, the correction that you get with an opening osteotomy is fairly significant. I haven't opened it more than 9, 10 millimeters yet. I think more than a centimeter correction, you would be worried because the ITB will become too tight and you might want to think of a Z lengthening of ITB if you are uh, too worried. But uh, with a plate which is not very close to the joint, uh, the ITB can compensate in my opinion with less than 10 millimeter correction. And I have uh, another question. So when you showed your lateral view of your osteotomy, the, the plate was, was actually placed perfect. But in some smaller patients, I have sometimes or I'm sometimes afraid of interference with the lateral patella facet or the lateral patellofemoral joint. Um, do you have any strategies to avoid or do you change to, to, to a different implant in small patients? Well, to be honest, uh, the, the, the plate size is quite big for uh, Indian patients. So I sometimes in petit females don't use the LDFO plate. I uh, use a medial plate from the synthesis system for the lateral side. but uh, And that way I can get a good fixation in the metaphyseal region. Uh, but generally speaking, if you are uh, careful in your patient selection, you can avoid this. And of course, the biplane that you're creating, you can make a longer biplane to compensate for the uh, lateral part of the patellofemoral femoral joint and don't go in the joint as such, or don't violate that joint. Okay, so thank you for, for your presentation. And um, now I head back to, to, to Tom and uh, ask if we have any questions from the audience as well. Yeah, thank you, Professor Nehemiah. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I can see Bert there. I think, Bert, have you got anything to, to add or any questions yeah. to ask? Yes, first of all, a short introduction, my name is Bert Bracker. I'm uh, from Munich, a product manager for, responsible for osteotomies throughout EMEA and thanks to uh, Tom and the Dubai team for setting this up and thanks also to Professor Niemeyer and to the panel for joining. Um, one question I have, I've, we've seen the concept of a, a placing a K-wire to protect a hinge fracture intraoperatively. Is this something that is also applicable uh, when doing an, a, a lateral DFO. Dr. Sabnis, for instance, I haven't seen that on your presentation. Yeah, so uh, generally speaking, it's not required if you're very careful. But anytime when I'm worried about osteoporotic bone or on the opposite side, if it's too tough a bone, then you can suddenly crack it when you're trying to open it. Again, same principle as an HTO. If you slowly open it, then you will not have uh, not to worry of uh, breaking the hinge. But uh, I haven't put a, a wire on the on the medial side yet. If I need to, I will always be ready to put um, a simple staple or a screw suffices if you break the hinge with so much of soft tissue network that it always scars back in my opinion. Mm. Thank you. And the yeah. other uh, panel is is that the technique that you also like to to do to get more security to prevent uh, an, a broken hinge. So if I may, may comment on your question, if it's relevant on the femur, I, I would actually state that it's even more relevant on the femur because you don't have the fibula as an additional stabilization. And I'm, to be honest, more afraid of hinge fractures on the distal femur than I am on the proximal tibia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a quick question to Professor Nima? Yeah, go sure. for it. Yeah, so uh, I just saw the hinge wire that you placed. You put, you place the wire from medial to lateral, just from the distal part of the osteotomy. Uh, we, uh, I don't know, I think Nagaraj also does the same thing. We pass a wire from outside to it, so from lateral to medial from uh, from the tibia. Any specific reason why you would go from uh, medial to lateral? The, the reason I'm asking you this question is you can go very close to the cortex, about two to three millimeters when you're passing from outside in. That means from the lateral side to the medial side. Uh, and whenever I'm, I've tried to place a wire from medial to lateral, it always leaves a, a big one centimeter hinge. So it just makes life difficult to open the osteotomy. Just a yeah. so, so to be honest, the original concept also of the hinge screw is described in a manner that you were suggesting. 
uh, from the lateral side. But in my personal setup in the OR, since the image uh, intensifier is coming from the opposite side, uh, from the same side I'm doing the surgery on, I always had a problem uh, to, to keep sterile conditions. And that's why I just started using uh, the K-wire from the inferior medial parts. And it, it, it works quite good if you're getting used to it, but your, your remarks are absolutely uh, correct and, and, and relevant. Tom, do we have any questions from the audience? No, I think we're I think we're good to go, guys. Uh, we've run slightly over, and I think um, if there's nothing else from from the panelists, uh, I think we're we're probably ready to close. Um, Professor Nimai, anything else from yourself before we finish off? No, I really appreciate it, and uh, I thank uh, the faculty and Artrex for the invitation. It's really been a pleasure to join you. And it's also and really a pleasure to, to get input from, from uh, foreign and other countries uh, for my side, which is really appreciated. Yeah, great. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, guys. Um, a big thanks to Ivana and Rashir, as always. Uh, mm -hmm. Mostly a big thank you to our faculty members here today. I'm sure everyone's going to agree that it was extremely informative. A mm -hmm. uh, brilliant insight into to different variations of, of knee osteotomy. Uh, I hope everyone has a, a lovely rest of their day. Please do get in touch with, with Arthrex Dubai or Havana if you need any more information. Um, thank you once again to our faculty and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.